Hello, welcome back science lovers. I'm Jason. Today I'd like to dive into a truly mind-bending question, one that everybody here has everyday experience with and honestly blows me away every time I think about it. The first thing I want you to do is take your hands and clap them together or just take your hands and try to push your hands together really, really hard. The question is this, can atoms ever actually touch each other? And since molecules are just collections of atoms that are bonded together, can molecules ever actually touch each other either? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, of course they can touch each other. Look, I'm touching each other right now. But I promise the answer to this question is not quite as simple as it seems. Nothing in quantum mechanics is ever very simple. And the answer just might make you question everything you think you know about physical contact. Now, first things first. The first thing we need to do is tackle what we actually mean when we say that two things are actually touching each other. So what does touching actually mean? Now in our everyday world, in our everyday language, what we mean when we say that things touch, we mean that they come into physical contact with each other. Like just for instance, when you clap your hands or push on a door, sit in a chair, anything like that. But when you get down to the atomic level, things get weird, really, really weird. Now to understand why things get so weird, we first need to talk about electrons and their quantum nature. Why are we starting with electrons? Because every atom, as you know, is surrounded by electrons. When you have molecules bonded of different atoms, again, it's the electrons that's surrounding in a cloud around all of the nuclei, which are very, very small. So when you bring two things together, the electrons are gonna be the first things that come in close proximity to each other. The first thing we need to say out loud is that electrons are not like tiny planets that are orbiting a nucleus. They don't behave like a solar system. They exist in something called electron clouds, but even that is a loose analogy we'll talk about here more in just a minute, which are regions described by what we call wave functions that tell us the probability of finding an electron at any given point or in any given region of space. Now, I'll just be blunt here in the beginning. What you were taught when you were in third or fourth grade about electrons being little balls that go around, you know, that famous cartoon of an atom, it's just wrong. We're taught that when we were young for two reasons. First, it's pretty easy to visualize because it kind of reminds you of a solar system with planets going around, which you're also learning around the same age when you're very young. And the second reason is that when all of these atoms were first discovered and people started probing the structure of the atom and electrons were isolated and neutrons were isolated and such, the way that quantum mechanics works is that when you measure something, whether it's with your eyes, which we're not really using our eyes for electrons, but you get the, you get the analogy, or some sort of detector to detect where the electrons are or whatever, then the wave-like character of whatever it is you're measuring collapses to the point at which it is observed. And it, to us, appears to exist as a point in that space. So quantum mechanics is a little weird because the theory goes that when you're not looking at it, now I don't mean consciously uh, as an observer, as a human, I'm talking about when you're not measuring something about what you're studying, when you're not at all uh, interacting with it, put it that way, it behaves more like a wave more like a, a waving structure that has a crest and a trough and an amplitude and a phase and all the things that are associated with waves, which also means the waves can interfere with each other, right? And we know this to be true from many, many experiments. But when you measure, meaning you have to put some probe there and disturb the system and measure, the wave-like character temporarily disappears and it appears to be a particle-like structure. That's why for so long we thought that electrons were just little particles and protons were just little particles and so on, but we now know that everything has a wave-like character. And when I say a wave-like character, I mean that we have equations that we can write down to describe water waves. 
we have equations that we can write down to describe, you know, transverse and longitudinal waves and the traveling nature of the waves, electromagnetic waves, right? You remember sines and cosines back from math class, which can also be written in terms of exponential, e to the power of, of whatever the exponent is. But in quantum mechanics, the waves are described by a wave function, which has a similar form. The only wrinkle is that this wave function has a complex, meaning imaginary number amplitude, and a complex phase, which is in the exponent up there. So it's a little more complex, quite literally, than a regular wave that we write down, but that is the true description of everything we see, which is a quantum particle. And by the way, when I say everything is quantum in nature, I do mean everything. You see, when we studied light in the early days, it was very obvious that it had a wave-like character because light waves interfere with each other. You can set up experiments to very easily verify that light waves interfere. Later on, it was discovered that uh, that light also comes in discrete chunks that we now call photons, and it has a particle light character. So light, we now know, has a wave light -like character because we can observe that very easily with interference and thin films and things like this, but it also has a particle light -like character. And then in the early days, we started probing matter, and we first discovered its particle light -like character based on experiments with matter. Then later, we discovered its wave light -like character. So it turns out that all photons have a wave and a particle light -like character, and all all matter particles, whether electrons or whatever it is, has a wave and a particle-like character. So everything in quantum mechanics is described by a wave. That wave collapses to some point in space, and that wave amplitude in space describes the probability of finding the thing when you decide to measure it. That's what we mean when we say that the wave function collapses, because it describes the probability of finding whatever it is you're studying. And by the way, if you're skeptical of this idea that matter, like electrons, also has a wave-like character, and by the way, you should always be skeptical of things, but if you are, then just know that we can build a machine called an electron microscope. You may have heard of it. It shoots a beam of electrons down, and that can create the image of what it is you're trying to look at. Now, the only reason that electron microscopes function is because we understand that electrons have a wave-like character. And the wavelength of a very high energy beam of electrons, that wavelength is much, much smaller than the wavelength of visible light. And that's why electron microscopes can be used to look at things much, much smaller than an optical microscope. So this wavy nature of matter and this particle nature of waves of light they're all very, very real, and we would not be able to build many of the things we can build today if at least we didn't understand something about the wave-like nature of everything around us. All right, so hopefully by this point, I've somewhat convinced you that there's a mountain of experimental evidence saying that electrons, solid bits of matter, have a wave-like character. But here's where it actually gets fascinating. The electron probability clouds, the wave function, they don't just stop at a certain point, like a hard boundary. They technically extend forever, and I do mean forever, all the way across the universe, getting exponentially weaker as they go. So if we define two things touching as the electron clouds overlapping, well, technically everything in the universe is always touching everything else. Are you mind blown yet? Because we should say that a few times out loud because it should blow your mind what I'm just now saying. So let's restate it one more time in a slightly different way so that if your mind wasn't blown the first time, it should be blown now. When we study the simplest atom, the hydrogen atom, there's a single proton in the nucleus and there's a single electron outside the nucleus. The whole point of this video is to ask, do two atoms ever touch? And so you have to define what touching is. Now, the electron on the outside surrounding the thing, uh, orbiting, for lack of a uh, quote unquote, the thing, it's not a ball, it's a wave function. When you write down that wave function of that electron that describes the probability of where it will be when you measure it, the wave function doesn't just stop at a hard boundary. You know, we say an electron's like this big, or, or a, uh, a hydrogen atom is like this big, whatever it is, I'm using my fingers here. But actually, the electron wave function around any atom does not just stop, it exponentially decays. Remember, I told you wave functions involve exponential functions. They exponentially decay. So technically, what it's telling you is it's most likely to find an electron near the hydrogen atom, but technically that electron could exist around that hydrogen atom one or two kilometers that way. It actually also could exist all over beyond the Neptune, uh, the orbit of Neptune. It also could exist over five light years that direction or that direction. Because remember back from chemistry, we learned that electrons fill in 
in uh, energy levels, in, in shells, in orbitals, right? And so for the simplest one, it's a spherical orbital. Now, the way we draw it in books is that it stops, but actually the uh, probability of finding the electron just decays down close to zero, but never getting to zero, no matter how far away you go. So when we look at an atom right here, the electron is most likely to be here, but it technically could be 50 million kilometers that way because of the way the wave functions work. So what I'm saying is that's true of every piece of matter that, you've, that you can look at in the whole entire universe. So when you're trying to ask yourself if two things are touching, then one way to define it is would their electron probability densities, their wave functions, ever overlap? But since every single electron's electron uh, uh, probability density or wave function exponentially decays and goes on forever, everything in the universe always has their uh, electron wave functions always overlapping. So technically, if you use that definition, everything is always touching. And the same thing is true no matter what electron orbital you're talking about. You know, in chemistry, you have the p orbitals, which will look like little dumbbells, and then you have d orbitals, and you have other shapes, but they behave the same way. They never stop. They go on and on forever, getting very, very small amplitude as you go along. So the probability of finding an electron 10 kilometers that way is very, very small, but not zero. And by the way, that little fact about uh, wave functions never really ending for electrons or anything else, that might go down as one of the top mind-blowing science facts that I personally know. But wait, there's more. What if we define touching of atoms as getting really, really, really close together, below some, some distance that we define? Well, this is where things get even stranger. You see, when you sit in a chair, you might think that your atoms are touching the chair's atoms. Your bottom or your backside, you might be thinking that you're touching the chair's atoms, but they're actually not. What you're actually feeling is the electromagnetic repulsion between the electron clouds, meaning the electron clouds of the electrons in your butt and the electron clouds of the atoms in the chair, they get very, very close together. But they're never actually touching because before they can get too close, you're feeling this incredible electromagnetic repulsion between the two electron clouds. Remember, electrons have this thing called charge, and they're all negatively a charge, and they all like to repel each other. So as the atoms get pushed closer and closer together, this repulsion gets exponentially stronger. And when you sit down, you're literally floating above the chair, suspended by these electromagnetic forces. So you're never actually touching in the conventional sense that we all think of in our mind. And also, I'll just remind you that the electromagnetic force is millions and millions of times stronger than gravity. So it is absolutely strong enough to suspend you or levitate you above the chair. Okay, so when we sit in a chair, we're not actually touching because of repulsion. But what if we built a machine to squeeze it, to try to force the atoms to occupy the same space, like some kind of reactor, like a fusion reactor or something, to push everything together? What I mean by this is to force two electrons in two outer electron clouds to physically occupy the same location in space on top of each other. In other words, one on top of another. Well, this is where quantum mechanics throws another wrench in the works, and it's called the Pauli exclusion principle. If you've ever taken chemistry or physics, you may have heard of this. It's very, very important and really is the main reason why atoms exist the way they do with electrons in different orbitals. This fundamental law of physics states that no two electrons can occupy the same quantum state at the same location. And it's the reason, as I said, that electrons fill in orbitals anyway. And so because of that, it's basically responsible for all of chemistry. You could quite honestly say the Pauli exclusion principle is the reason why anything really exists chemically with chemical reactions. Now, the reason why the Pauli exclusion principle is so important is it literally keeps matter from collapsing in on itself. Basically, without it, atoms would be able to overlap completely and the whole universe would collapse into a super dense blob. So in a way, we should be thankful that atoms can't touch in this sense. Now, here's something really cool that's related to this. While electrons cannot occupy the same quantum state at the same location in space, particles of light, which we call photons, actually can. So this has to do with a fundamental division in the particle world. Particles in general in physics come in two broad types or two broad classes, fermions and bosons. So electrons are what we call fermions. They come from the class of particles called fermions. 
Now, what distinguishes them is that they have what we call half integer spin. Spin is a quantum mechanical number that describes the particle that we're talking about. And because of that, they follow the Pauli exclusion principles. They're kind of like antisocial teenagers who refuse to share their room. Basically, they don't share space. So that's what matter particles are, and that is part of what is the reason why I can't put one fist through the other. But photons are from the other class of particles called bosons. Those are particles with integer spin that can pile up on top of each other and they can occupy the same quantum state in the same location. They are totally fine occupying the same space without crowding or pushing on each other. Now this difference is crucial for how the universe works. Because photons can overlap in space and in location, in quantum numbers, we can create powerful laser beams where countless photons occupy the same state. That's what a laser is. And so because of that, electrons cannot overlap. We get the structure of atoms and the rich chemistry that makes life possible. Basically, we take it for granted that photons can pass right through each other. I'm being bathed right now in all these photons from the studio, and they're crisscrossing paths and they're going right through each other. That's because they come from the class of particles that allow the same quantum numbers of the particle to exist in the same location in space, so they can pass right through each other. They don't obey any kind of Pauli exclusion principle, which is only true for fermions, electrons, and other matter particles. Electrons cannot occupy the same space because uh, the Pauli exclusion principle says that you cannot have two fermions in the same location with the same quantum numbers. And by the way, these quantum numbers, they're just numbers that describe the state of the particle and they come out of the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics. They govern angular momentum, spin, energy level, and other things that describe what the particle's doing. So let's get even more mind-bending. When atoms do get extremely close, like they do in chemical bonds, they don't actually touch. They instead share electrons in quantum mechanical dance, so to speak. It's called electron sharing. Even in the densest material, like neutron stars way out in space, atoms are not technically touching. They're being crushed so closely together that the electron clouds actually break down entirely, creating something completely different. So let's take just a minute to summarize this because it's a lot of info and some of it seems a little bit weird. Quantum mechanics is weird because we don't observe individual atoms with our eyes. What we see are huge collections of atoms in aggregate. So to answer the question, can atoms ever actually touch? Well, it actually more depends on how you define touching. If by touching what you mean is that electron clouds are just overlapping even just a tiny bit, then everything in the universe is always touching everything else because the electron clouds, the wave function, technically extends all the way across the universe, getting closer and closer to zero as we talked about earlier. But if by touching what you actually mean is just things getting really close together, atoms are prevented by this from two things. So the first thing that'll get you is the electromagnetic repulsion of the atoms or molecules. But if touching means occupying the exact same space, like if you could build a machine to ram it into the same space, then the Pauli exclusion principle makes that impossible because fermions, matter particles, electrons, atoms, cannot occupy the same space with the same quantum numbers. That's why things like electrons don't pass right through each other. Now I have to say really quickly that there are extreme examples in the universe like black holes where all of this stuff breaks down and we don't actually know what happens inside of a black hole. We take a neutron star and we squeeze it even further into a black hole. The Pauli exclusion principle probably breaks down in that situation. But for every day is what I'm talking about here. These are the reasons why you can't technically touch or you can't pass matter through each other. So next time you're sitting in a chair or next time you're pushing against the wall, I want you to remember something. You're experiencing quantum mechanics in action by these everyday things that we do all the time. You're floating on a cushion of electromagnetic repulsion between electron clouds, and you're never actually touching anything at all. I'm Jason. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope I've successfully, quote, baked your noodle, I like to say. If I haven't uh, caused you to say, whoa, really? A couple of times, then I haven't done my job uh, well. So I'd like you to cogitate on what we talked about today. I'd like you to drop me a line. Let me know what you think. Tell me what you think about all this. And I want you to always remember to stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.